Hello everyone, welcome to this new Analyst Angle. And today we're gonna talk about interesting market data that our friend Jason Buffington is bringing to us. Hello Jason, how are you? Good to see you, my friend. So uh, tell us about this survey that you recently conducted. I think you went out to 1,200 respondents, uh, different types of personas. Let us more, uh, know more about that. I'm, I'm very curious about it. So one of the projects that we do at Veeam is we're always looking for unbiased market research. So let me bring up a slide that has all of our demographics on it. One thing to notice here, not Veeam customers. One of the most important things that we can do to really understand where the market's going, so we understand what to build, is looking at all the personas and how that affects across lines. So in this case, on the left-hand side, you can see there's three personas that we really leaned into. The CISO, right, that executive that has uh, stakeholder power, um, the security professional who's responsible for prevention, and then the backup admin who's responsible for remediation. And you can see on the right-hand side that um, it covers demographics of all sizes. So anyway, so that's what the project is about. So Christoph, I know you and I have both had a lot of time uh, looking at market industry research. I will tell you what I'm really proud about in this project, 1,200 organizations, all of whom self-reported they had at least one successful cyber breach in the past 12 months. Um, most of them had more than one, so 1,200 respondents, just short of 3,000 lessons learned. And this is our third year doing it, and it always provides some interesting insights. You know, uh, what's very interesting here is that obviously ransomware is not going away anytime soon. Uh, it's just like not having, you know, statistics on the future. Well, here it doesn't matter. There'll be more. We know that. Uh, yeah. that's, a, that's a problem. What's interesting in, in your sample uh, is the fact that you've actually looked at uh, this new world of IT and cyber resilience where security meets storage, backup, data management, data protection. Uh, and that's very key in my opinion. So uh, I'd like for us to uh, maybe think uh, a little bit more about uh, this topic in the context of additional uh, data that you've uh, identified. What would be the most salient point that you want to bring up uh, to uh, our viewers as the first thing you really want to get their attention on? Yeah, and this one is worth getting attention on. So let's take a look at this slide. And in fact, I would encourage all the folks at home, take a screenshot of this one. This to me is endemic of the problem that our industry is facing right now. So one of the questions that was asked in the survey, we've done it for three years in a row, is basically, did you pay and did it work? Right, And so there's kind of four outcomes that you get. There's about 4% on the gray wedge, which is arson, right? They didn't ask for ransom. They just came to do damage. But let's take a look at everything else, because when you add up the orange, they paid and could recover, and the red, they paid but still could not recover, that's 81%. Four out of five organizations actually did pay the ransom. But if you think about it, 27 out of 81 paid and then still couldn't recover. Christoph, think about this. You've had a problem, you've had a breach, you went to your boss, you got the Bitcoin, you wrote the check, whatever that was. In one out of three cases, they paid but could not recover. That's our problem statement. Now, I don't want to have to go back to the chart again, but just to kind of point out what that looks like, if 27% said they paid but could not recover, only 15% said they recovered without paying. Right. OK, you know, maybe we'll bring the chart back up again, because really that's 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 what our goal is. Right. The goal should be for the other 85 percent of the victims out there to be say, no, we're not going to pay. We're going to restore. Right. That is really what our um, uh, what the, the, the landscape looks like today is more people nearly double paid but could not restore than those that restored without paying. What are your thoughts? Well, this is. Very fascinating. As a matter of fact, I'm curious uh, to see what best practices the 15%, one in six, actually use to be able to recover, because I think therein lies the solution to the problem. Uh, there is, uh, it's not just luck. Uh, I'll, I'll put it no. this way. Given those numbers, there is no luck here. So I do believe that what we have going on is the combination and the confluence of, of really, you know, teamwork, uh, cyber teams and uh, cyber ops teams and security ops teams working nicely with the backup and recovery folks in order to get to that 15% uh, and that recovery. But it takes a lot of planning and, and certainly a lot of uh, expertise to do that. The other point is, uh, I think, very important. You're talking about bitcoins and, and costs. Um, 
that are associated with the ransomware, but the truth is that's just the uh, tip of the iceberg. What about all the other costs? And uh, maybe you didn't do that in the research and looked at the operational costs and uh, other uh, regulatory issues that could have come up, but clearly the cost of the Bitcoins is just the tip of the iceberg. So it's a big problem uh, with big money, uh, and that's why uh, we keep seeing cyber attacks. Fair point. And, and actually, it wasn't in my plan. I actually do have a slide for that. So if you want to get nerdy on, on the numbers, the dollars, let's let's talk about that for a second. Because one of the things that was new in this year's research is we actually asked organizations how much was the ransom and then how much was the overall bill, right? So how much was the overall business impact? And you said it perfectly, right? There's so many things above and beyond the ransom itself. So that number on the left, it turns out on average, when everything was over, the ransom was only representing 32% of the overall business impact, right? So if you want to put real numbers on this, let's say that the ransom was 320,000. I'm just taking the digits and adding four zeros on the end, right? $320,000 is the ransom. If that's 32%, that means your overall business impact was straight out of clean mill. Now, here's the fun part. We asked a second question. When everything was said and done, because of course everyone has cyber insurance, right, Christoph? Yeah. Right? When everything was said and done, how much did the insurance pay back? And that's your number on the right. You only paid back a little over half. So using that same math, you got asked for 320,000, your overall bill for the event was a million dollars, you got 570K back, fast algebra, right? Meant you were on the hook, you took a $430,000 loss along the way. Christoph, this is insane as far as how those numbers go. Again, you should really download the whole report, you know, hit that QR code. Hopefully someone can uh, see that in the upper right hand corner. But um, but yeah, the, the numbers are staggering as far as how that goes. Well, so here's a, just a few thoughts for this. And I know it's a conversation we've had before and we'll have again. Uh, the uh, cyber insurance, I wonder if, if number one, it's maybe already a thing of the past. Premiums are gonna go up. Clearly it's not working. Yep. Uh, and actually in order to get cyber insured, which actually may be a very positive thing here, uh, a lot of insurers will ask that you actually demonstrate your recoverability and do A, B, or C, uh, the one, two, three, zero, one, two, three, four, whatever number is now. Uh, the net net is the requirements for obtaining cyber insurance in the context of ransomware are going up, the premiums are going up, and yet uh, the payouts are not really where they need to be. So again, I'm looking at a positive aspect here, which is uh, the more you do to improve, because you may be motivated to get cyber insurance because it's a requirement from your organization, it may be a legal requirement, maybe a governance requirement, uh, yep. but don't think you'll get your data back necessarily. This is purely financial operation. Uh, which clearly is not that great looking at your numbers, uh, Jason. No. Yeah, and again, that's why and I am I am obliged to remind folks, not even customers, right? This is an unbiased sample to understand what the whole world is facing. I guess market share wise, I guess we're representing 13 or 14% of the sample, but you get the idea. I think there's a couple other things that um, that as folks are starting to rationalize what they need to be thinking about and the prioritizing of this. Let's talk about a few other things that came out of the research. Um, here are a couple of stats that, I, that uh, we talk about. Why is it only 15%? Christoph, you said it best, right? It's one out of six, I think, um, overall that we're able to restore uh, instead of paying. Well, probably the number one reason why that number is not higher is because according to the 1,200 uh, victims from last year, in 96% of cases, one of the bad actors' first task was to remove the ability for the customer to save themselves. Right In 96% of cases, they attacked the backup repository. And, oh, by the way, in three out of four, they were successful. The backup repository was affected in 76% of attacks. It's like, you know, Christoph, you throw me off on the side of a boat in the middle of the ocean, right? What's the first thing you want to do to make sure that I pay the ransom and I buy your life preserver? You pull up the ladder. And you make sure there's nothing around me that's floating, right? Remove the ability for me to save myself so that I will pay for your life preserver. That's what's happening here. What do you think? So here's the thing, uh, protect the protector. I've uh, been saying this for a long time, but what that means is actually very fundamental to uh, the type of uh, features and functions that you should be looking for as you build your cyber resilience infrastructure. Uh, the type of questions you should be asking vendors uh, in terms of immutability, 
recoverability, you know, best right. practices. Uh, it's, uh, you know, you, you're, you have to be very, very cautious uh, with how you architect uh, your, in this new world, your backup and recovery for cyber recovery, not just for the traditional disasters we, uh, we got used to. Uh, you don't know what's going to hit you. You don't know who's going to attack you. But one thing is for sure, at some point, somebody's going to need you to restore. Uh, yep. Here's, here's the, the thing I like to say and like to joke, uh, and, and it's a bad joke, frankly. When the cyber guys call you to say they need a, a restore, it's probably already too late. But I want to uh, dwell on one more point, which is the backups are getting attacked. Okay? Yeah. So, Obviously, your backup recovery vendor, cyber resilience vendor, uh, what do you do at Veeam to really make sure that you are really uh, impossible uh, to attack? Well, I think first and foremost, we have the advantage in being a software delivered solution, right? So we'll embrace whatever kind of immutable, air gappable, separatable, offlineable, you know, pick your favorite kind of architecture that you want. We're not bound to what is within your appliance or what is within your cloud. We'll take just about anything that you can deliver. In fact, one of the lessons learned that actually came out of the research, we don't have a slide for it right now, um, was the idea that um, as a lesson learned, or excuse me, 85% of organizations now embrace a cloud that has immutable capabilities. And so in our case, that's everything from the hyperscales like Amazon and Azure to solutions like um, VCSPs that offer BAS or DRAS or Wasap. I mean, there's a long list of where you can get immutable storage. There's a long list of on-prems and we happily work with all of them, right? So um, uh, um, uh, lockable um, object storage, NAS that has a hardened repository on Windows or Linux. I mean, there's a lot of ways to do it. And, and Christoph, we know each other 20 years. Let's not forget tape, right? <laughs> the ultimate air gap is take it out of the drive um, and still have it readily available. So there's a huge amount that you can do from that. And again, because we're software defined, we are embracing that. The other thing that um, is a differentiator for us is one of the other things that we actually learned during the research was not only did they attack the repository, but in many cases, the um, the the victim realized too late that they were not going to be able to simply wipe and re uh, restore the original metal that got infected, right? In fact, on average, the victim said 30, uh, more than 30% of their infrastructure was not able to be immediately reused, which means, and you mentioned it before, you know, cyber is not the only disaster, right? There's all the disasters that you and I have been trying to solve for the last 20 years together, all of those disasters still hold true. And you might have other metal in another data center, or you might need to pick a cloud or a managed service provider. We embrace all of those options, but let's give you options on where to recover from survivable storage. So, you know, actually what you just uh, brought up here is important because another aspect to this is, uh, let's say there's an attack, you're a highly regulated environment, maybe financial, doesn't matter. Everybody is highly regulated these days. Uh, it turns out that you may have to call the authorities, the FBI, and what do they do? They lock up your data center because they're going to yeah. do forensics. Uh, so you have no metal <laughs> to begin with to recover to or, or recover from. So that's why you need those options. And I think it's a very, very good point. Um, look, um, you've, you've covered multiple facets in, in the research. What, what would be another interesting point you want to uh, bring out here to our uh, audience? I guess the last thing is, and this really comes down to lessons learned. So put yourself as the IT director. Um, you have suffered a breach. Um, you have let senior management know. Um, uh, and now you have a lot of pressure. You have a lot of folks whose titles all start with VP or C or something else that could be really scary. And the pressure is how quickly can you get back up and running again? But you're having to do this under duress at scale. Right? That's the normal, that's the that is that is what almost every cyber incident looks like. And so there is a human nature to cut a corner here, what can we make faster there? And so the guidance I would offer is physician do no harm. Let's bring up one more chart that I think is pretty scary. And that is organizations were asked, how do you ensure that you're not reinfecting the environment as part of trying to bring everything back online? Right Now, what you're looking on that left-hand side is 63% of the respondents said they did not have a mechanism to ensure the data was not going to be reinfected or reintroduce malware as part of their restoration process. Only 37% of the, of the victims said, no, we have a way to sandbox, quarantine, stage, whatever 
feature product name you want to call it, but the idea to ensure not being able to reinfect the environment. Christoph, think about all the years that we've spent in backup overall and the idea of, okay, now I'm going to have to cut corners to do that. I kind of think of it like this. If you ask if this, if the, the bully in the schoolyard has gotten your lunch money once, right? And they want more money. They're going to come back to the kids that paid, right? I had a bad experience in middle school, so I can, I can attest to that. They know where to go. And if you're not careful, you're going to actually reintroduce some of those holes a second time. And so a couple months go by, they're ready for more lunch money. They know where to start, right? So I guess the, the major feedback I give to the kids at home is be thinking about sandboxing. Think about quarantine, because otherwise you, you will be a repeat offender. Well, Jason, we've covered a lot of uh, ground here, so thank you so much. And I think these are, um, you know, great words of wisdom. And I agree that, uh, you know, this idea of sandboxing and, and really in general terms, preparing and, and running tests and, and, and practice really makes perfect. That's really the way to do it. That's the way to exercise those muscles that uh, will come in very handy when, uh, unfortunately, it hits, which could be any time and typically is never at a good time. Uh, but is there ever a good time for ransomware? So uh, Jason, thank you so much for joining us today and we'll see you soon. Thanks for having me. Thank you.